Hello and welcome to Refuse. In my previous She-Hulk video, I said that I was going to do a follow-up, a second video, uh, detailing the last story arc, the Jen Walters Must Die story arc, which is four issues long and it leads to the series being cancelled. However, after the first three parts of the story, which kind of wrap up the storyline there, and it seems that part four is going to be an epilogue and I have a feeling that it's going to be a doozy. So I decide to make that a third video. So instead of this being a two-part video, this is going to be a three-part series. The first 11 issues were in the first part, linked below. This will detail issues 159, 160, and 161. And then the final issue, 162, the cancellation of the series, I'm going to give it its own video. Uh, but one thing I did want to say before we begin... In the previous video, I stated that had the series started with this story arc, it'd probably be doing a lot better. I'd like to walk that back a little bit. You <laughs> see, I was reading those issues um, when I did the last part of the previous video. Um, only the first two parts had come out. And I read the first 11 issues back to back by that point in preparation. And they didn't seem so bad when compared with those 11 issues. I've since gone back with the third issue being out. I've reread the story again, the three issues, 159, 160, and 161, and realized that they're not very good. <laughs> I don't think they're as bad as the first 11 issues, but Mariko's writing pitfalls are really obvious. I'll get into that. Mostly it's still the pacing. Um, do I think these three issues are stronger than the previous 11? Yes, I do. But not by much. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and get into issue 159. So here is the cover of She-Hulk 159. Now this is the Marvel Legacy branding. This is the first issue where it went from the Hulk series from issue 11 to the new She-Hulk series. So this would have been, um... Hulk number 12, the first year of Mariko's run. And as you can see, they've done the rebranding. And, you know, one of the things I did, like I mentioned in the last video, um, with the original 11 series, for the most part, I liked the covers. While they didn't really talk about or reference overall what was going on in the story, I did like those covers. I thought they were pretty eye-catching. Now, again, we could talk about uh, what sits on the comic shelf, what grabs the reader's attention. It doesn't really show what the issue's about, but I like those issues. I like most of the covers. This one, however, it's more of a comic book style action cover that you would expect from the big two. Um, you know, you have in shadow the Hulk gen over her human form with the leader in the background and... It doesn't really work for me. The leader reveal is toward the end of the issue, and the cover gives it away immediately. So I got to take off a point. If I was reviewing it, I would have taken off a point for that. You could have had a good, um, you know, villain reveal on that, but unfortunately, it was given away. So when we open up, we see that they have changed the first page where it says. Uh, now She-Hulk must search for a way to become She-Hulk. What? I thought the whole point of the previous 11 issues was, Jen, I'm not She-Hulk, I'm just Hulk, that's what I am. But thanks to the Marvel rebranding, she has to become She-Hulk. Minor nitpick. I'm, I'm going to try to avoid the minor nitpicks. Um... My last video was an hour long, and this is only three issues, so I don't think I could be as nitpicky, so I'm going to try and keep this a little bit shorter. So the issue opens up with Burger Cake's Diner. L-O-L. That is goofy. Can you believe that there's a place called Burger Cakes in downtown Manhattan in the Marvel Universe? Oh, that is zany. Stop trying to be funny, Mariko. Why would Jen even meet someone here? It's really stupid, and 
you see that this ditzy blonde who is Robin that we've seen in the previous issues, she even makes a comment, oh, I should have thought of that. No. No, you should not have. So the first few pages is this interview that Robin is giving Jen. Now, we as a reader know that Robin is the person that was spying on her from the previous uh, issue. Uh, but Jen hasn't quite figured that out yet. So here's where we start dipping into Mariko's crutch. The flashback. Robin asks, was this the TV van you smashed? And then it goes back to one week earlier outside of a courthouse. This will come up a few times in the, in the series, in the next three issues, where Jennifer had just gotten a mutant acquitted. And, well, we see the beginning part of the story. We see a sign that's about to be thrown at Jen's head. Well, it has been thrown. It's about to hit. What TV van? Now, obviously, Jen does want to talk about it. And this is where... She decides, that's it, you know, interview's done. So she leaves the restaurant, and she calls Patsy. And, of course, Patsy's in her Hellcat outfit, and she's standing there watching, as she says, uh, they're trying to rob a bank, but it's not a bank. It's complicated. Patsy's up on a rooftop watching some people break into a building that they think is a bank, but it's not really a bank. You know, there's something interesting about this book, about Mariko. She tends to bring up things that seem really interesting, but then just doesn't follow those threads. She goes down another path. We just sat through several pages of a boring interview while Patsy is watching a couple people robbing a not bank. What does that mean? I mean, obviously, it's sunny. There are people out. Uh, we, we've seen kids playing in other pages. So it's broad daylight. How do these people not know that it's a bank? I want to see what's going on with those robbers. That sounds like an interesting story. It's kind of like the uh, uh, glowing face ninja people that attacked Maze in the first uh, story arc. Or the landlord's mutating hand from touching cake things junk. And that came out really wrong, but you know what I mean. Um she brings up these things that seem more interesting than what we're reading. I want to know what's going on with these robbers and why Patsy's just standing up there. But anyway, um, you know, Patsy says, you know, it's complicated. Why does everything suck? And they're kind of depressed. I, is Patsy still hurting from Jen not kissing her in the last issue? I mean, this is like the first time that, that Hellcat is off going doing something else and not watching Jen. No, instead she's watching some robbers break into a not, not bank. Okay. So anyway, during this conversation, Jen's phone gets stolen. And she runs off chasing the kid that stole it. And she's making quips and Mariko stop trying to be funny. Who is this kid? I mean, his eyes seem to glow, so... Is he a robot controlled by the villain? You know, I'm trying to not give it away that it's the leader, but the cover did it, so. So we see the kid turn around, and um, she recognizes that it's the voice. And while she's distracted, um, you know, she turns into the Hulk when she realizes it must be the leader. And she sees the leader's shadow, and then you see an arm come up with a giant robo hypodermic and stab it into Jen after she's turned into Hulk form. Now, if you looked at the sleeve at the design, trust me, I looked closely. That is Robin's arm. You see it earlier in the diner scene, which is like one of the only times I've seen Mariko use any type of like foreshadowing thing like this. Um, the art and the color actually matches up, but how does she, as a normal human, even if there's some type of robo-hypodermic, how does she get it into Jen? And notice how lucid Jen seems now that she's in her Hulk form. I mean, granted, she's just saying a couple words, hello, whatever. Uh, this kind of goes against what we've been seeing and what we will be seeing about Jen's loss of control in the Hulk form. Sometimes she, it seems like she has 
complete control, that she's just a slightly angrier version of herself. And sometimes she seems to be completely hulked out, crazy, like Bruce Banner, rage in the day. It's it's so inconsistent. And it looked like the first story arc had her get that under control. Um, had even the symbolism of the story cover with a uh, close-up of Jen's face with the donuts. So... But again, here we are. We got Hulk being subdued in an alley. Yay. Jen wakes up and finds herself strapped to a table with Robin standing over her, fan curling out. And then she starts saying, I'm a real fan of Hulk. Not the Hulk like Bruce Banner. Not She Hulk. Now, I know I've been going back and forth between Colin. Jen, She-Hulk, and Hulk, I've been trying to respect the series. But how did Robin know, even though she's been stalking Jen, how does she know that Jen goes by Hulk now? And if she was a longtime fan, why isn't she calling her She-Hulk? Anyway, Robin is so annoying that Jen even mentally goes away. It's almost like Jen doesn't want to be in her whole, her own book. And here's where I have a problem. Another flashback. Again. Watching Netflix and texting Hellcat while she's strapped to a table. This is her mentally getting away. This flashback serves no purpose. And let me explain something. You know, I've taken creative writing classes back in the day, and I had a professor tell me that you should be very, very careful using flashbacks. They should be used to strengthen something that has already been established, or otherwise it is just going to slow the story down. Now, in previous issues, when they showed Jen having a flashback talking to Bruce when she was still She-Hulk, that's understandable. Tamaki was not writing the book at the time, so if she needed to do something like that, show some type of Bruce-Jen interaction, fine. A flashback is understandable. But here, this does not move the story along whatsoever. This is a completely wasted page. And honestly, this pisses me off because Mariko uses flashbacks constantly. Another thing my professor said was it also shows a lazy writer or a writer that's not thinking ahead. If they do a flashback to something that they had already established because it says, hey, I forgot to show you this thing earlier. Let me show it to you now. And that is the way this comes off. In fact, it doesn't even, not even that. She's sitting on a couch. She's watching Netflix. It does not further the story along at all. Okay. I'm okay. So then Robin gets really close to Jen after Jen snaps back to the real world and says, I want you, silly. Is there a woman in the Marvel Universe that does not want to sleep with Jen? I mean, she didn't say, I want to be you. She just gets this crazy ass smile while Jen is strapped to the table and says, you know, I want you, silly. If Robin had been a guy... With this context, you'd be seeing this panel on the Mary Sue and people bitching about it. <sighs> so then the leader comes out and says that he's not going to reveal all of his plan because he's the smart guy. And guess what we'll find out? That he doesn't have much of a plan and that the plan he has is pretty stupid. Surprise, surprise. You see, the plan, which is a dream that Robin didn't even know she had uh, is to obviously use Jen to make Robin a She-Hulk. Isn't that exciting? No. No, it's stupid. It's really stupid. Now, reading this when it first came out, I thought, okay, maybe there's more to the plan. We're just seeing this. This is what we're gathering. I'm going to tell you right now. Nope, that's pretty much the plan. Now, this issue has a backup feature that I just want to touch upon real quick. For one thing, it's not written by Tamaki. Notably, there's a line in here that says she thought she could control her rage. Rage that has been pretty much gone since Jen's first series. I don't know why they're bringing that part back. And now when she feels rage, she's afraid to become 
to She-Hulk because she's out of control. Really? And like I said before, one writer, Mariko Tamaki, has inconsistently portrayed She-Hulk's personality this entire series. Is she in control? Has she gotten over her rage issues? Uh, Jen's currently strapped to a table, I don't know. <laughs> and one final thing. Why does Jen look like the witch from Left 4 Dead on this page? Here we are at issue 160. Now this cover is a little bit better with these electro whips trying to restrain She-Hulk. Um, it's a striking cover. Um, but again, it shows more action than the first 11 issues but it doesn't reflect what's actually going on in the series. At least the last issue did have Leader prominently in the background showing he's manipulating things, I guess. This one kind of goes the other way. Still kind of action. I like this cover better, but it doesn't really reflect the issue. So let's start right into the book, and we open with a flashback! How many issues have opened with flashbacks in this run? It's so annoying. Now this is a continuation of the the courtroom flashback uh, that we saw before. You know, here Jen is noticing different things, um, and then she gets hit by the sign that was alluded to. Uh, we see a little bit of blood drip from her head, and then it cuts to... Is it a dream? After she becomes Hulk, we see her rampaging, blacking out, and then... Jen is trying to talk She-Hulk down. Um, a little, that might be actually some foreshadowing. Mariko might have done some foreshadowing with that. I, it, honestly, at this point, I think it's accidental. So, Jen talks her She-Hulk form to, talks her down, and we'll, we'll come back to the out of control She-Hulk thing in a bit, because it's a dream. Robin is here, she's drugged up Jen, uh, and Robin is being dizzy again. I, you know, I, I kind of think they were trying to go with a Harley Quinn kind of goofy ditzy, but she's actually, you know, a smart person. You know, she's a scientist or professor. Um, Jen called her a professor in the interview. I don't know if she's actually a real professor. Um, but then we go into a little bit of her origin as she explains that the leader came to her, um, in her lab a year ago. Keep that in mind. She came to her a year ago. And she states that she and the leader are both fans of Hulk. Now maybe the leader is saying Hulk and Robin took that to mean Jen when he was actually talking about Bruce. And again, why is Robin calling her Hulk and not She-Hulk? Like I said before, if she's been fan a fan for such a long time, she'd be more likely to say She-Hulk since the whole Hulk thing is pretty recent for Jen. You know, I don't think she's been gray for a year in Marvel time now. Probably only a couple months. So then Robin explains that the leader funded her gamma research. And, oh look, more eating. Yeah, I mentioned in the last video that there's like eating in every issue. You know, the last issue started with Robin and Jen in that stupid restaurant. And here there's more food and more eating going on. Uh, just a... Little observation there. And Robin states that, you know, due to the leaders funding her gamma research, that she understands the changes to uh, Jen's She-Hulk gamma form. And then we go to another flashback. Again, I'm sick of these flashbacks. But we're back at that courthouse scene. You know, I... At this point, I really wish that they just would have shown the courthouse scene and then went back to it periodically, uh, instead of showing it bits and pieces in flashback, and I'll explain why here in a second. We see Robin injected adrenaline into Jen's ass. That's what caused her to hulk out, um, and that's why she needed to be brought down by her friends and the military without any casualties. Um, but see, this would have worked so much better if at the beginning of the first part of the story, they showed the courthouse scene. Um, they could show Robin in her little disguise here, just kind of walking by Jen and bumping into her. And then the flashback shows what really happened. Instead of little bits and pieces. I, it would have worked a lot better that way. 
Instead, like I said before, this just looks like lazy storytelling, and I'm going to show you what I didn't tell you earlier. The flashback is Mariko's crutch. So anyway, Robin tells Jen that she has to die because she's killing She-Hulk. And then she goes from ditzy to crazy. And then suddenly, not even like, what, a few pages later, we have another flashback. That's a third one in this issue. But this one is to Robin as a child getting her hand stepped on and being told she's worthless. This is the big motivation scene. One line of dialogue could have corrected this. At some point during the talk with Jen, Robin could have said, I've been called worthless all my life, and that's going to change starting now. Boom, I just saved a page of uh, of this useless story padding. <sighs> Her pacing, Mariko's pacing, is just so bad. By the end of this issue, Jen will have been strapped to a ch- to a table for about an issue and a half. You know that's how sh- our heroine has spent the past issue and a half. <sighs> anyway, where was I? So anyway, Robin goes to do the blood transfusion, and the leader tells us about how the military and Jen's friends were able to dis- subdue her before anyone was killed. You know, this is kind of going back to the flashback thing I was talking about at the courthouse. Because, you know, the military has been called uh, Jen's friends. This is, seems like it'd be, I I don't know, a pretty fucking important piece of information about the out-of-control gray She-Hulk theme that uh, Mariko has been trying to write about. We don't see it. We only see bits of flashbacks. Mariko, she cannot write a superhero book. Why she was allowed to get into what would be now the 13th issue, why she was able to get this far, I don't know. Uh, She should have been pulled off the book because this is so poorly paced. It's so poorly. The narrative is bad. All this important detail, she just kind of waves off there. But, but a little fat flashback that could have been done in one line, as I just showed, oh, that gets its entire page. At this point, I think I pretty much hate read this book now. Uh, I don't know if I'd still be reading it if I didn't know it was being canceled. At this point, it's like, I want to see where this train wreck ends up. I want to see how many people it takes out in the countryside. So now we see the leader's master plan. Remember in the previous issue, he said he wasn't the type of villain. He's a smart guy. Well, we find the plan that he started a year ago. A plan that involved monitoring, testing, and observing Jen fighting robots and then giving her adrenaline, forcing her to hulk out as civilians at the courthouse was just a plan to watch her be destroyed in an arena for entertainment. That's his motivation. That's it. Why did the editors allow Tamaki to write this? Does she even pitch a proposal? Or is she just turning in issues one after another? Surprised? They had no idea what she was doing. Did anyone remember that the leader is a smart guy and realize that this, this is a dumb plan? Again, I think I just hate read this book now. So, Robin does this blood transfusion. Let's not even talk about how hard it is to do that to oneself. And... Robin comes out in her Hulk form, and let's just look at this for a moment. Yeah, I'm kind of beyond caring at this point, but I'll be honest, I just laughed when I saw this page. When I flipped over and saw this was the Robin Hulk, I mean, where did Robin get that outfit? Was she wearing it under her clothes when she transformed? Or did the leader just kind of leave it out for her to put on while he was talking to Jen? It's stupid, and the flat-chested halter top is just laughable. Now, I know Robin has been shown to be small-breasted, and real-life female bodybuilders tend to need to get implants because they have no fat stores for breasts. I understand that. So I have a theory about this design. They had to use a halter top to show that she's a woman, and therefore we knew it was Robin. You see how it looks? 
you know, all pecs and muscle in the chest. I mean, there's not even any indication of breasts. There's nothing feminine about this form. You know, as I said about, I think, Hulk, the first cover issue, where her hips were much slimmer than her shoulders, kind of skewing that whole female balance of the hips to shoulder uh, being in alignment. And again, we kind of have that here. If it wasn't for that halter top, we'd have no idea that this was supposed to be a woman. And if they had her wear a, a full shirt instead of showing off her stomach, we would just think that was a guy. You know, they had to leave the shirt, leave her stomach uncovered so that we knew that this was not a dude. So summing up, stupid design, leader has a stupid plan, and this is a stupid book. Oh. Oh, 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 but wait. Oh, you just wait. Part three. Oh, part three is aneurysm causing. Before we take a look at issue 161, I want to take a moment to talk about the villains of the series. In the first story arc, we had Maisie, who started out as a human, and I said that she may have became an inhuman. I don't know. It's never really explained if she was an inhuman or if she turned into her kind of monster form with the eyes and everything. Um, if that happened after her attack. But regardless, she was a woman who was physically and violently attacked and left in a coma. In the second story arc, we have Oliver, who is a gay YouTube baking channel host, I guess you would say, and he ends up having some monster juice stuffed into his food, and he becomes a monster. He's just trying to become human and turn normal, but he starts raging out. In this storyline, we have Robin, who is kind of ditzy, but she's easily manipulated by a man to become a monster. You could say she's a victim as well. So we have three villains and they're all victim monsters. I just want to take a moment and point that out. So anyway, here's the cover and I hate this cover. It's it's poorly laid out. You know, I I see what they're doing here, showing the master manipulator with his little chess piece action figures. It's been done a thousand times. This one, it actually took my mind a, a couple minutes to process what my eye was seeing. We have the Jen that's really close to the foreground in her classic She-Hawk form with what looked like a couple bites taken out of the shoulder. Then we have the one that's broken in front of her while we have some of the rampaging gray hulks coming at them while the leader is watching all this. Yeah, I see what they're trying to do there with the whole broken She-Hulk analogy. This cover would have worked if the leader was the one behind Jen's transformation into the gray hulk form that she's in now. But he's not. It's... It looks just like a guy playing with toys. So. so let's start into the issue. And here's a surprise. We open with a flashback. I am so tired of these flashbacks. I complained about them in this video. Complained about them in the last one. Anyhow, here's where we're showing that the leader has been manipulating Robin. And we spend three pages on this before... Whoa, wait, wait. Is that a 30-foot ceiling? It's just a little alcove in the wall with a couch and some side tables and a painting in the 30-foot tall room. That must have been a selling point on Zillow, but I'm going to tell you that is going to be a pain in the neck to heat come wintertime. So anyway, here we have... Back to the present day, we have Jen, who's running away from Robin in her Hulk form, which is <laughs> kind of like a boy. Um, I again looks like a guy, but she's running. She's running from Robin's small chest, and then stops to try and talk her way out of it. And she even calls out the leader on his stupid plan. Now, I want to make a little nitpick. I know I said I wouldn't. Um, 
but here's one. How did Jen know Robin's full name? Yeah, I went back over the previous issues, and I couldn't find where Robin's full name was ever mentioned. How does Jen know this? Why does... Why? Anyway, Jen is trying so hard not to turn into She-Hulk that she runs up Carpenter Special Robin's arm. <laughs> How big is she? It's, I get it. That's why she needs a 30-foot ceiling. That's why she needs a 30-foot-tall apartment, because of how big she was going to be. Okay, it makes sense now. So, after somehow not being killed by being thrown into a wall and smashing it up, Jen finally starts to lose her grip, and her eyes start glowing, and then we turn the page, and she is laying on a floor with blue energy coming off of her. You see, this is the point where the book not only jumps the shark, but it does a double flip off the diving board and lands face first in a giant tub of tapioca crap. You know, it, it seems that this is some type of astral type plane where little girl Robin, she says she goes there when she's hurt and that Jen is currently killing her. Now, is this a power that Robin has? Is she reaching out to Jen? Uh, is Jen reaching out to her? Who knows? Tamaki never explains this ass pull. And it just gets worse from here. You see, the pages alternate between the physical fight and then the astral conversation that Jen is having. When Jen gets her eyes attacked in the physical world, and the astral world, they're bleeding. So, Robin says that she's going to die, and it goes on until astral Jen is able to run out to the She-Hulk and talk her down. Again, that's why I'm saying this battle doesn't really make much sense. I guess they're trying to go into a, a battle in the mind, but is Robin reaching out? And if that's so, how is Jen? Is is this metaphorically Jen is going out in front of her She-Hulk form, calming her down? Uh, you think it might be that? But just wait a moment. Because you see, Astral Jen is now gone. And Jen is standing over anti-breast Robin, saying to the leader that Robin will live. She jumps up and attacks the leader, electricity from his own defenses flowing through Jen into him, taking him out. Now the fight's over, and Jen waxes philosophical for a moment, and then Astral Robin is standing over her own IBTC Hulk form. So, was this a power Robin has? What is going on there? Anyway, rescue crews finally show up, as does Hellcat. You know, this is about the only time in the series that Patsy wasn't right there stalking Jen. I was binge watching flicks! That's Patsy's excuse. But no, I suspect the only binge flicks were on Patsy's bean as she was thinking about her almost kiss with Jen in issue 11. So Jen says she needs to go and figure this out. She's, she's finally going to go see Doc Samson, right? No. No, no, she's not. She's going to go see her other stalker from the first story arc, Aunt Flo. Why? Why her? Jen even called her a crackpot in the first story arc. Can't believe I'm doing this. You see that line? I'd like to think that Mariko did not even write that. You see that somehow Jen's character. She got a voice for one panel to decry this horrible series she's in and why she's being forced to do the things that she's doing. Well then, let's get started, is what Aunt Flo says. Shouldn't this have been done if she was coming back to this a while ago? Ugh. This has got to be the worst issue of this Hulk series. And this would be what, issue 14? I'm actually surprised it made it over a year. 
They're going to make it to issue 15, which is issue 162, and then it is thankfully done. So that was a look at parts 1, 2, and 3 of the Jen Walters Must Die storyline, um, issues 159, 160, and 161. Um, like I said, I was going to do two videos, but I decided that I have a feeling that the way this book was canceled, they had to kind of rush it. You know, I'm trying to give the benefit of the doubt. Maybe that is the reason behind the ass pull in issue 161 with the astral plane thing. But I, I, I'm not even sure about that because the way Tamaki has written through this story, she pulls stuff out of her ass. This just happened to be the biggest one. Um, she paces things so poorly. You know, like I said, we had Jen strapped to a table for an issue and a half while she just reflected and there was dialogue. And then she had that flashback scene, that one page flashback that added absolutely nothing to the story. Again, another crutch, her poor pacing and flashbacks. This is a series that needed to die. And I say this as a big She-Hulk fan. And this has just been painful to read. It looked like at the beginning of this story arc, like it might be getting good, but then she just nosedived. And maybe it's the rush as the book's being canceled that they have to do the, what they're calling the journey to the center of her mind, which will probably involve her going back to green as they kind of reset everything so she's back in her green forms for the next writer to handle which is fine you know let's just kind of quietly sweep this under the rug and i said in the last video that the idea of she hulk with ptsd is not a bad idea but the way this book portrayed it it was the first story arc and then she seemed to come to grips and then the next story arc she seemed to be in control, and now she's no longer in control. And that's a problem I have with the end of the storyline. Um, well, the end of part three, when she goes to see Aunt Flo. Because she's talking about not being in control, and she needs to get this sorted out. Now, again, the first storyline, it looked like she had it sorted out. And here she's more out of control, blacking out, whatever. But Robin hit her with that uh, hypodermic with the uh, adrenaline in it, causing her to hulk out at the courtroom. And then when she was hit with the hypodermic again in the alley, somehow in her hulk form, that calmed her down. We've been seeing Robin injecting her with stuff. All these control issues she's been having in this storyline has not been Jen's fault. She's been manipulated by the leader in Robin and forced to change into a rage monster. So now why does she need to suddenly get things under control? This, this story showed that it wasn't her fault. She was being drugged since the beginning. You know, that's where it started with the courthouse scene that started issue 159 when they were talking at that Burger Cakes place. Mariko is inconsistent, and that's what's so annoying about this book. Neat premise, you can go somewhere with it, that she seems to resolve it, then, oh, no, we're right back to it, she's out of control, and now, wait, it just showed that it wasn't her fault. She's a bad writer, I'm sorry, I've been trying to give her the benefit of the doubt, and I haven't read her other work. Maybe it's good, I've heard it's more slice of life type stuff, but in this format, she needs a little bit more practice. You know, I'm trying not to say she's horrible. I'm trying not to say she's bad. But this has been a bad series. And given the way this series has been suddenly canceled, that's why I'm giving part four of the Jen Walters Must Die, the what looks to be the epilogue, the, the resetting of the character. I'm going to give it its own video. So thank you for watching this i hope you watch part one if not it's linked below and i'll see you again as soon as the next issue comes out in a couple of weeks and again thanks for watching